Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game to video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Apple versus Samsung, as Apple have been awarded 539 million US dollars on the patent infringement retrial, which has recently taken place. Then we're going to move over to another piece of Apple news, this time not so rosy for Apple. You may recall Bendgate, right, where iPhone 6s were bending seemingly at the power of your mind just looking at them well according to leaked documents these are internal documents from apple just to clarify they knew that the iphone 6 plus was 7.2 times more likely to bend than the iphone 5s so we're going to be going through those details and many others in these juicy internal documents and then we're going to finish off with amd specifically epic according to security research firms the virtual machine encryption has been defeated and hypervisors can actually lift plain text information out of ciphered memory. Before we begin, normal thing, if you click the like button and the subscribe button as well as the bell icon because that apparently occasionally does something, I'd be very, very, very grateful indeed. But with that said, let's start things out with 539 million US dollars. So this case actually dates back to 2011 where Samsung were accused of infringing on several different patents. The first were three design patents and two utility patents. So the two utility patents were 5.3 million and the various design patents were 533 million. Then in late August of 2012, it was determined that yes, Samsung did infringe on Apple's patents and then there was a retrial which would simply determine the amount that Samsung owed Apple. So how much were originally Apple seeking in damages? Well, a billion. Uh, that was one billion back in 2012. So technically speaking, Samsung have actually done pretty well here. They've got the fine down by over, well, around 50%. Slightly less because it was 1.045 billion in damages. Samsung, however, aren't particularly happy with this and said that the statement following the verdict on Thursday flies in the face of a unanimous Supreme Court ruling in favour of Samsung on the scope of the design patent damages. Therefore, the lawyer of Samsung, John Quinn, has told the US District Court Judge Lucy Coe that they don't believe that the verdict is supported by evidence. Now, you may say to yourself, well, why are Samsung fighting this? Is the company worth about 250 billion US dollars. So if you do the maths there, they've still got a few pennies left in the bank. But Apple summarized this best. They said that this is not about the money. They feel that they, Apple, ignited the cell phone revolution. And they feel that Samsung essentially copied their design and they feel that this case is more of a statement of, hey, we were the originators, we created this thing, and you basically took, saw what we did and said, oh, that looks cool, we can make money from this, and well, there you go. So this is more about Samsung appearing guilty of actually copying Apple's designs, and that's why they're trying to fight this tooth and nail. I'm going to love them with you. I'm not an Apple person. I've never owned an iPhone. I don't, unless something changes, I've no intention of doing so. I currently own an Android device, but... It's hard to argue that Apple have been very instrumental in bringing smartphones into the foray, and it's it's kind of weird. Like if you look back just tenish years ago, twelve years ago, and to see how the market was when people have PDAs, and you had like the the PSPs and all this type of thing, and it's hard to argue that the original iPhone, which was released in mid two thousand and seven, really had a major impact on the market. The problem is you can also say much the same for Samsung. I don't want to side with one company or the other because I truly believe that Samsung, Apple, plus other companies were major contributors into the technology we've got now. But if you also look at the stuff that Samsung have brought to the market, whether it's screens, whether it's this, whether it's that, both companies have put an awful lot of research, an awful lot of effort into creating the devices we have today and although this is very different in terms of the scope of you know filing patents and certainly in the scope of actually uh you know suing anyone but if you were to look at the xbox one versus ps4 
as in the base specifications, there's a reason that both companies, both Sony and Microsoft, came to very similar conclusions. They were to look at the off, you know, off-the-shelf components, not exactly off-the-shelf, of course, they did have quite a lot of customization, but ultimately there were certain ways they could go, and both companies decided to go a very similar direction. That's why, of course, both ended up with AMD Jaguar CPUs, that's why both ended up with an APU design, and there were a lot of details that were different, such as the type of memory, the GPU configuration, clock speeds, that type of thing. But essentially, they both kind of went the same way. And that's because if you pose engineers certain questions or certain problems, engineers, well, generally speaking, particularly if they've gone to very similar levels of education, they will generally speaking come to very similar conclusions because they're following a logical train of thought. Does that mean that I'm saying that Samsung did not copy the design? No, ultimately that's down to the courts to decide because no matter what happens at the moment, it's really down to a case that's going to stretch absolutely years and I don't feel that this is going to be argued uh, and then settled within the next couple of years by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying that these, you know, lawsuits are going to become increasingly common. Not that they're not common now, simply because at the end of the day, it's very difficult to create designs and then have those designs which don't appear to infringe on another pattern. However, news is not necessarily all rosy over at Apple. The folks over at Motherboard have managed to grab hold of some documentation and this shows that the phones, of course subject to the beautifully termed Bentgay, I'm sorry that just pleases me so much in terms of the name it just amuses me, were actually most likely known by Apple to be, uh, well, let's just say faulty. So you may recall that both the iPhone 6 and the 6 Plus were released in September 2014, and it wasn't too long after that that customers were complaining that their phones were bending. It, of course, went viral because, well, these things happen. And then Apple shortly released a statement where they said that the phones were structurally sound, and Apple performs rigorous testing throughout the entire development cycle, including three-point bending, pressure point cycling, sit, torsion, and user studies. iPhone 6 and 6 Plus meet or exceed all of our high-quality standards to endure everyday, real-life use. And that was, once again, a quote from them. Of course, eventually the bend gate fiasco started to drift away, but a couple of years later, iPhone 6 and 6 Plus devices then started to sim exhibit symptoms known as the touch disease. This would mean that the screens themselves would have a flickering grey bar, and the touch screen would then stop working either entirely or would work at best intermittently. And according to repair experts, they believe that this is because of the Touch IC chip becoming partially unseated from the phone's logic board. And of course, you can probably guess where this is going, that's right. The simple fact of the matter is that experts believe that the flexing and bending with the normal use of the phone was literally pulling or stretching the micro-soldering on these chips, and well, you get the idea. In the big oopsie, however, uh, Apple were, because of the class action lawsuit, which then, of course, started to be put together, Apple were required to release all internal testing documentation. After all, if you're alleging that your internal documentation shows that, yeah, your phones are going to be up to snuff, you have no issues, no qualms actually putting that out there, right? Well, not so much. According to their own documentation, after internal investigation, Apple determined underfill was necessary to resolve the problems caused by the defect. Apple has used underfill and preceding iPhone generation, but did not start using it. The touch disease, sorry, touch disease related chip in the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus until May 2016. This is according to a US District Court judge. Her name is Lucy Coe. And according to Apple's own major concerns, which were identified prior to the launch of the iPhones, they were more likely to bend more easily compared to the previous generation. How much more? Well, uh, I'm going to read the statement out verbatim. Moreover, Apple's internal testing determined that iPhone 6 was 3.3 times more likely to bend than the iPhone 5S, the model immediately prior to the subject phones, and the Apple iPhone 6 Plus was 7.2 times more likely to bend than the iPhone 5S. 
So now Apple are left arguing against various expert witnesses, which of course Apple themselves are trying to downplay and so that they are not expert witnesses because they had not, quote, reviewed Apple's internal testing. And according to the judge, uh, Ms. Co opposes plaintiff's motions for class certifications on nearly every front. And Apple responded that they state that the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus boxes were kept in the back of Apple stores and were not visible until they were bought out so a customer could buy one. And then Co herself wrote that these points are not persuasive. There's a lot of things, of course, that's going to happen in this case as well. But ultimately speaking, I think these documents are pretty darn damning. The bottom line for me is it was pretty obvious there was something wrong with the phones. I mean, sure, if the odd one's slightly bent here or there, then, you know, you can... Like, a bit like the Switch. Like, we, we all saw the Switch slightly bending. And certainly speaking, when you're seeing millions of people buying a device, there is, of course, a certain number of devices which are going to be faulty, right? That's just kind of a given. Some of them are going to bend, some of them are going to break, depending on the type of device. But the sheer number of iPhone 6 Pluses that were bending from people who had only just got the darn device, it was very unlikely to me that it wasn't anything other than a manufacturing defect. And now the bad news finally comes to AMD, and that is that they are facing their own security issues. Epic, well, you may recall it has its own secondary processor, which, just for your FYI, is a 32-bit ARM Cortex-A5, which acts as a microcontroller, and it supports secure encrypted virtualization. This, as the name would suggest, encrypts and decrypts virtual machines on the fly. What happens is each virtual machine is assigned an address space ID, and that's linked to a cryptographic key to a cipher and decipher to, and that allows the ciphering and deciphering of data. I got there in the end, as it moves between the memory and CPU cores. The imperative thing here is that the key itself never leaves the SOC system on chip, and each virtual machine gets its own unique key. In theory, at least, this means that if you have a virtual machine which is compromised, if you have a compromised driver or whatever else, they should not allow, let's say, virtual machine A to spy on the data of virtual machine B and C and so on. However, there is a technique dubbed as severed. See what they did there? You see it? And it's claimed if you use by a rogue level host administrator a malware within a hypervisor or similar it can actually bypass sev protections and copy information out of a customer or user's virtual machine this is according to german researchers and the researchers matthias morbitzer manuel huber julian horsch and sasha wessel hopefully i'm pronouncing all of those create uh, properly outlined an details of their attack. With Severed, we demonstrate that it is nevertheless possible for a malicious HV hypervisor to extract all memory as an SEV encrypted VM virtual machine in plain text. We base Severed on the observations that the page-wise encryption of main memory lacks integrity protection, while the VM's guest virtual address, GVA, to guest physical address, GPA translation is controlled by the VM itself and opaque to the HV. The HV remains responsible for the second level address translation, SLAT, meaning that it maintains the VM's GPA to host physical address mapping in main memory. This enables us to change the memory layout of the VM in the HV. We'll use this capacity to trick the service in the VM, such as a web server, into returning arbitrary pages of the VM in plain text upon the request of a resource from the outside. The research has continued and said that our evaluation shows that Severed is feasible in practice and that it can be used to extract the entire memory from the SEV protected VM within a reasonable time. The results specifically show that critical aspects such as noise during the identification and the resource stickiness are managed well by Severed. However, the research team did say that there are some ideas that they had to actually help AMD. And they've 
uh, released those uh, pieces of information. They said that the best solution seems to be to provide a full feature integrity and freshness protection of a guest page addition to the encryption as realized in Intel's SGX. However, this likely comes at a high silicon cost to protect full VMs compared to SGX enclaves. A low cost efficient solution could be to securely combine the hash of the page contents with the guest assigned GPA. So far, AMD have not commented on this, but of course, that it was only released on Thursday, so it's only a couple of days now, so they've not exactly had a long time to actually put together any type of response. And you've also got to remember, of course, currently it is, well, I'm recording this on a Sunday, but this is a holiday weekend, so the number of people that have been in the, in the actual, you know, offices are probably going to be considerably lower. Uh, you know, you've probably got people who have taken a long weekend vacation, that type of thing. So, of course, it's going to take longer for them to respond. But back in 2016, late 2016, December, another set of German researchers, these uh, were working on behalf of the Technical University of Berlin, also identified shortcomings of the architecture. And their previous studies had examined how memory management systems could actually poke inside encrypted guests by hackers. Hopefully over the next couple of days, AMD will release a statement on this so we can get a better understanding exactly what, if anything, they can do to mitigate this uh, threat because obviously we are gonna have to wait and see how they respond before we can you know, know whether there is anything they can do to patch this in software via, via a BIOS update, a Windows update or whatever. Um, at the end of the day, I suspect a lot of folks who were considering perhaps upgrading to Epic for the benefits of SEV are going to be watching AMD's response to this very, 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 very carefully. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.